content comes not from the environmental climate. We're going to leave this briefing from Wednesday to go live now to a House hearing on the future of the electricity grid and the national transmission policy. Among those set to testify, John Wellinghoff, who's the chair of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. This is live coverage on C-SPAN 3. Proposals for reforming the national transmission uh, policy. There uh, is no more central issue to, uh, to resolve here than uh, this uh, question. Three weeks ago, the Energy and Commerce Committee passed the American Clean Energy and Security Act of 2009. This landmark legislation on which the House will soon vote will revolutionize our nation's energy policy, creating millions of clean energy jobs, saving uh, consumers billions of dollars in energy costs, and unleashing trillions in new investment. The 21st century grid will play a central role in this revolution, wheeling the country's vast wind, solar, and geothermal energy resources to market enabling the electrification of our transportation system, and multiplying energy productivity through smart grid technologies. The Waxman-Markey bill recognizes this role by establishing a new framework to plan the grid of the future. We task the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission with establishing national grid planning principles which it will use to support and coordinate regional planning processes across the country. Within three years, the Commission must report back to Congress on the results of this effort, together with recommendations for further congressional action if necessary. Some believe we should go further by substantially expanding federal authority to plan and cite new transmission lines. That includes overriding state decisions to reject proposed lines, and using federal eminent domain authority if necessary. I think we need to look closely and skeptically whether such a step is warranted at this juncture. I urge caution for three reasons. First, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. As several of our witnesses emphasize, there are a number of innovative and promising bottom-up planning processes now underway, from New England to the Midwest to the West. We should give those processes time to succeed. Moreover, as Commissioner Azar's testimony emphasizes, one of the greatest obstacles to developing the grid of the future is not a lack of federal authority, but rather uncertainty as to what energy policy that grid must serve. By establishing a national renewable electricity standard, a firm cap on carbon pollution, and efficiency programs that will dramatically curb growth in electricity demand, the Waxman-Markey bill will provide the certainty needed to guide private, state, and regional development of the transmission system of tomorrow. Second. Look before you leap. Transmission is amongst the most complex and controversial aspects of energy policy. Today's hearing is literally the first hearing in this committee, in this Congress, or the last Congress on transmission. We cannot afford to take a ready, fire, aim approach in this area. Further, there appears to be little common ground amongst core stakeholders. To give just one example, we invited the Edison Electric Institute, which represents investor-owned utilities that own most of the nation's transmission system, to testify today. EEI cordially declined, in part because it was unable to agree on a witness that could represent the disparate views of its membership. The testimony before us confirms that it is very tough to find agreement in this area. And third, to a man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Precipitous action could result in a policy that is ill-suited to address the problems at hand and could lead to perverse consequences. For example, the Western Governors Association will testify today that, quote, Western governors see little benefit in preempting state transmission line permitting processes because, because, quote, the major hurdle 
for permitting transmission in the West has been securing permits from Federal agencies. In other words, it is the Federal Government, not the States, that is the problem from the perspective of the Western Governors. Several witnesses in the East emphasized that Federal planning or siting authority could actually undermine regional efforts to develop renewable resources and encourage expansion of high carbon generation uh, in the Midwest. We need to take time, take a careful look at this, and see what really makes sense. Today's hearing is an excellent beginning to this process. We have a great lineup of witnesses, and I look forward to their uh, testimony. I would like now to turn to a matter related to the subject of today's hearing, which has been brought to my attention. After I agreed last month to hold an oversight hearing on the subject of electricity transmission and the question of whether to adopt additional new legislation in this area, in addition to the regional transmission planning language that is already in the Waxman-Markey bill, I directed my staff to obtain additional information about two important provisions of the 2005 Energy Policy Act that also dealt with transmission in which are directly relevant to today's hearing. As part of that effort, the subcommittee sent two letters to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. The first letter, dated June 3rd, dealt with the impact of the 2005 bill's incentive rate provisions on the construction of new transmission around the country. That letter was sent out last week. The second letter, dated June 9th, dealt with the impact of the 2005 bill's repeal of the Public Utility Holding Company Act on the construction of new transmission. That letter was sent out Tuesday. Neither of these uh, letters were related in any way to the allocation hearing that the subcommittee held on Tuesday or Mid-American Holding C uh, CEO David Sokol's testimony before the subcommittee. They were being drafted prior to our even being aware that Mr. Sokol would be invited by the minority to be a witness at the Tuesday hearing. Both letters were aimed at helping the subcommittee better understand the impact of previously adopted transmission legislation. The PUCA letter contained eight questions, two of which referenced Mr. Sokol's earlier testimony before Congress in support of PUCA repeal. Mr. Sokol was one of the leading proponents of repealing PUCA which is why his prior testimony was relevant to the issue. However, these questions were in no way seeking to target Mr. Sokol or to intimidate him in any way for his appearance before the subcommittee earlier this week. The day following the release of the PUCA letter, I heard from Representative Barton uh, that minority members of the subcommittee had concerns about the questions relating to Mr. Sokol and the timing of the letter's release. In response to those concerns, I made it clear that there was no attempt or intent to intimidate any witness. In addition, to make it absolutely clear that this was the case, I sent a second letter to FERC clarifying that the FERC should respond to the subcommittee's questions generically and not just look at mid-Americans specifically. I shared a draft of that letter with Mr. Barton's staff and Mr. Terry's staff on Wednesday uh, night immediately uh, after uh, they brought this issue to my intention. I responded immediately to their concerns. Uh, and finally, uh, I reached out to Mr. Sokol uh, to inform him of what my intent was uh, to clear up the misunderstanding and to make it absolutely uh, clear that neither he nor his company uh, are the focus of the uh, subcommittee's uh, inquiry. Um, so I want to say to Mr. Barton, uh, to um, Mr. Uh, Upton, uh, and to the members on the other si side of the aisle publicly, uh, what I have already said to them privately, that I would never seek to intimidate or retaliate against a person uh, from having to come in and testify before this subcommittee. I value hearing the perspectives that all of our witnesses bring to the issues that we are considering. I regret any misunderstanding or misimpressions that the contents of the letter or its timing may have raised. That is why I immediately, after learning of the minority's concerns, prepared a second letter uh, to the FERC to direct them to respond generically to the questions rather than focusing 
on Mid-American. That is also why I contacted Mr. Sokol directly to let him know of my intentions and to express my apologies, which I have done. Joe and Fred and the other members, I just want to let you know that I have the personal uh, greatest regard for you uh, and that in no way do I want to uh, leave any impression at any time uh, that we would uh, conduct uh, hearings that uh, were not fair uh, and open to uh, all of the members uh, of the subcommittee or to the witnesses who appear before this uh, committee. And I just want to make that very clear, uh, very publicly. Uh, at this hearing, uh, and now turn to uh, recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Upton. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I, uh, I like many members on this side, do value your friendship. Uh, realize that we're adversary, good adversaries, on a on a number of fronts, and we've been together on a number of fronts. And uh, I know, as as we have talked about this privately, uh, that it is very important that there is no intention to uh, intimidate or uh, pressure witnesses to testify in something that they perhaps don't believe in. And uh, I, for one, appreciate your statement uh, this morning. Uh, I also appreciate you calling for the hearing today on national transmission policy. Uh, the electricity grid is of vital importance to our nation. We all know that. However, it is an area that is often overlooked, as evidenced by the fact that there were only minor mention of transmission in the Waxman-Markey Climate Bill, and that the fact that today, weeks after the Climate Bill has been passed out of committee, we're having our first really big transmission hearing. We do have a long and distinguished panel today, and I would like to thank all of our witnesses for joining us. I would like to give special recognition to the heads of two Michigan-based companies, Dave Jost and Joe Welsh. Uh, I know that ITC and CMS do not exactly see eye to eye on this issue, but I know that they have Michigan's interest at heart. And I would hope that we can all work together on this issue as we move forward. This committee passed a sizable renewable electricity mandate without any consideration to the question of getting the renewable electricity to population centers. The strongest winds are concentrated in low population areas. The strongest sun exposure is found in low population areas as well. Existing transmission lines are centered in areas of high population and there are inadequate high voltage lines to the areas with the most abundant sources of renewable power. If we're going to be serious about renewable power, we have to revamp the grid. And to, do properly, to properly do so, we'll have to block the lawsuits from environmental groups that have increased costs and blocked much needed transmission lines. But let's put it in perspective. According to DOE, it would cost $60 billion, yes, B is in big, in new transmission lines to reach the 20 percent mark for wind power. Al Gore's lofty goal of fossil fuel electricity would cost perhaps as much as $400 billion in transmission lines. And if we're serious, we must block the lawsuits and make real investments in the needed infrastructure. Good example of these lawsuits is found in California. The proposed Sunrise Power Link in Southern California will connect the region to existing and proposed renewable energy sources, whether they be wind, solar, or geothermal, located east of San Diego. Energy experts estimate that there is perhaps as much as 2,000 megawatts of geothermal power and tens of thousands of megawatts of solar available in the area. However, without new power lines, the clean green energy could not be delivered to its customers. Studies show that the line will reduce greenhouse gas emissions by as much as 1.3 million tons. Yet various environmental groups like the Sierra Club are fighting it well documented in publications like the Wall Street Journal. The areas that are best for wind, power, and solar are often in these very remote areas away from population centers. Transmission lines are needed to get electricity from wind and solar farms to consumers, and I feel it is a mistake to legislate a costly renewable mandate without addressing the transmission issue. With all of that said, we must also recognize that many renewable energy sources are unreliable and can br bring instability to the grid. Transmission lines cannot distinguish between the green electrons or the brown ones. 
So we just can't be planning a transmission system for renewables. We have to take all sources into account, wind, solar, nuclear, hydro, coal, clean coal, everything else. Changes need to be made to the current regulatory system. FERC can provide a backstop, but we must not completely abandon the state and local process. We must also be mindful of the costs. Renewable power is not free. Transmission lines are not free. Consumers deserve to know what the real costs are of any policy and understand exactly what they're going to pay for and what they're getting for their hard-earned money. Consumers are already going to be saddled with increased rate increases, and these costs will only go up under the Waxman-Markey bill. Transmission policy shouldn't add to those burdens. I yield back. Great. Gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks uh, both for holding this hearing and your great work uh, assembling the, the Waxman-Markey bill. Uh, I think that bill is a tremendous mosaic of using multiple tools to solve our energy problems. But it really is missing one critical piece. And that is the piece that will help us spur the development truly of a 21st century uh, national grid. And I think we have to recognize that today, um, despite the tremendous efforts of people in this field, we have a grid fit for the 19th or 20th century, but not for the new challenges of, of the new American energy policy. And the way I would categorize that new challenge is that we used to be able to move our energy components around by truck and rail. We could move coal to the site we wanted to generate electricity. We could move natural gas to the site where we wanted to generate electricity or heat. But we cannot ship photons on rail cars, nor can we ship wind by packages by truck. They have to be generated. The electricity has to be generated, in fact, where they are located. Our existing policy on the grid is, is satisfactory for the first scenario, but not the second. So I have now been uh, uh, at this for some time, hoping to advance our ability to plan, site, and finance the new grid system that's fit for the 21st century. I've introduced uh, H.R. 4059 and uh, had made some progress in the bill and hope to make further progress in hopes to uh, achieve this goal in this energy bill. I want to make, note several things. Number one, um, our grid system is doing good work today. I'm not sure you can say the grid is broken, but you can have a horse and buggy system that's working but not fit for today's new world. And we know that it will not be fit for the challenges of tomorrow. So while it may not be broken, it is certainly not fit for what we are now asking it to do. And it's my belief that if we are going to meet our appropriate and necessary 15 percent renewable energy goal, we will need to allow transmission to move forward. Second, I would point out that the reason we're here today and the reason we need to act today is that this is the only vehicle moving out of town and it will be the last chance and only chance to really move forward on this effort and we can't move forward with a renewable electrical standard without a transmission piece. So I think uh, Lincoln's old quote fits, as our case is new, so should we think anew? And thinking anew means federal backstop authority in the event that regional governments are unable to site these necessary facilities. And the reason national backstop authority is necessary is twofold. Number one, our grid has always been designed to respond to local and regional interests. But with the challenges of global warming and national security needs, we now have a national need for a national grid. And second, we know that while all of our constituents love electricity, virtually none of them love electrical lines. And there is a time and a place where Uncle Sam needs to step in to overcome, at times, the reluctance of all of us to bear, bear with some of the onerous aspects of moving electricity. It's simply necessary, and we know we cannot wait decades to move these electrons. So I'm very excited about hearing this testimony. Mr. Chair, thank you, and I hope we can get this job done in this bill. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Whitfield. I'm sorry, the chair, chair recognizes, I'm sorry, the, the ranking member 
of the uh, full committee, the gentleman from uh, Texas, uh, Mr. Barton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Since we have an oversight hearing on upstairs, it helps me if I could give my statement. I'm going to give a double statement, um, kind of a bifurcated statement. We'll talk a little bit about this hearing, and then I want to comment on your, uh, your, your personal comments, because I think we need to, uh, to elaborate on that a little bit. But first, on the hearing before us, uh, it's a scary thing when uh, I agree with Jay Inslee, um, but I do agree with Congressman Inslee. Um, his amendment in the committee on the climate change bill was directed, as I recall, towards green energy or clean energy for transmission. But once you generated that electricity, whether it's by wind, solar, or even uh, coal power, electricity is electricity and it's going to go on the same wires. Uh, and the wires don't know where it, where it, um, what, what the source of the generation was. So we do need to update our transmission grid. Uh, we started that process in the Energy Policy Act of 2005, and I thought we had bipartisan uh, support, and uh, it became law. Uh, the Fourth Circuit has ruled recently that parts of EPACT uh, 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 are not uh, uh, as they should be. Uh, I disagree with that court ruling, and I hope that the Supreme Court will, will overturn it. But in any event, I agree with Congressman Inslee that we do need to modernize our grid. Uh, we do need to give um, uh, FERC more authority, in my opinion, uh, to uh, make decisions in interstate commerce when the states can't do it themselves. Uh, we tried to do that in EPAC, and if that's not the right way to do it, uh, perhaps we can try it a little bit different way. Uh, in the Natural Gas Act, uh, we give the right of eminent domain to the FERC. Now, I don't know that we need to go that far uh, for electricity transmission. There, there, there is, all, in all probability, a middle ground uh, where the states and the FERC can work together. But in any event, Mr. Chairman, this is a good hearing. And um, I hopefully out of this will come some consensus on both sides of the aisle about what to do legislatively. Now let me comment on what you said, Mr. Chairman Markey, and when you were talking about the letter of uh, June the 9th and, and the comments towards the uh, CEO of Mid-American, David Sokol. Um, first of all, um, I'm very appreciative of what you've said, that it was not intended to intimidate uh, Mr. Sokol and that you've called him and are taking steps to make sure that, that to correct uh, what you say is that misunderstanding. Uh, to say that publicly means a lot, and I appreciate you doing that. But let me, uh, let me elaborate on why you, people like myself have expressed concerns. Uh, you can't make the best public policy if you don't have witnesses come before this committee and give their full, honest assessment of whatever the issue is that's before this committee. If we adopt a standard that the only witnesses that are going to be received um, are witnesses that testify to, to, the, uh, to the side of the question that the majority is supporting, you don't really have a full and f fair debate on the issue. Um, and in the instance that you alluded to, uh, David Sokol represented a point of view that was contrary to the majority's position on the climate change legislation and the um, allocation system that's a part of that, the allowance system. Uh, that's the side that needs to be presented to the American people. Now, it may be serendipity and it may be inadvertent, but within two hours of, his, of him giving that testimony, a letter was sent under your signature to the chairman of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission who is sitting before us today asking six generic questions and two specific questions about David Sokol and his company. And the chairman of the FERC was asked to respond in writing to you by close of business yesterday. How can that not be perceived as an attempt to intimidate? Testify in the morning, adverse to the position of the majority. Receive a letter is sent in the afternoon to the chairman of the regulatory commission with jurisdiction over your industry and your company. 
uh, asking probing questions about the conduct and business decisions of your company. Now, I take you at your word when you say that that was not intended and you are beginning to take steps to correct it. But what upsets myself and the others on the, major on the minority is that we, don't know, we do not accept that we can develop a mechanism where we allow any member, majority or minority, to threaten, to intimidate, to abuse the power of the office that we're given by the people of our congressional districts on behalf of the people of the United States of America. Now, you're already taking steps to correct the perception that perhaps intimidation was being attempted, and I commend you for that. Um, you're going to get a letter from myself and Mr. Upton and other members on the minority later today uh, asking that we consider those discussions to make sure that we make it absolutely clear that any citizen of this country that comes before this committee can testify to whatever they believe is the truth as they know it without fear of intimidation or retribution. And I think members on both sides of the aisle will share that goal. And if, if we are in absolutely certain that that's the way it's going to be, then nothing else will be said. But again, you and I have been friends for 25 years, and I hope we're going to be friends for another 25 if we both live that long. Uh, I have nothing but the utmost personal and, and professional respect for you and your conduct, and I'm honored to sit on the same committee as you. I've sat in that chair as, uh, as chairman of this subcommittee. So I think we can get this worked out. But uh, it's a serious issue, and it deserves serious consideration. And to your credit, you're giving it that serious consideration. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentleman very much, and I thank the gentleman uh, for his words. Uh, the chair now turns and recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank you for holding this uh, hearing. This is a complex and difficult issue. I want to thank the panel uh, for appearing this morning, and in particular the chairman of the FERC. I was, uh, had the opportunity to visit the FERC this week, and uh, it was a good, worthwhile uh, use of my time. This uh, issue is complex and difficult, as I just said. Uh, it's got economic uh, challenges, technical challenges, and political challenges. Uh, and I believe the outcome will be best if we do our homework, consider the challenges, and devise a rational and bipartisan plan. So uh, thank you for appearing, and I look forward to uh, your testimony. I hope I can stay most of the time this morning, and with that, I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Whitfield. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We look forward to this hearing today and welcome the witnesses, and we look forward to their testimony. I just want to make a couple of points. If the advocates for a renewable energy mandate are successful, there are going to be large portions of the Midwest that do not have solar, do not have wind power sufficient to meet their needs. It's going to be extremely difficult for them to meet this 20 percent renewable mandate without some federal involvement regarding the siting, the financing, the building of additional transmission lines. And particularly when you consider the Department of Energy's 20 percent wind energy by 2030 saying that they're going to have to build at least 12,000 new transmission, 12,000 miles of new transmission lines to meet that uh, need. And then when, on top of that, when you consider this recent Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals decision that uh, Ranking Member Barton mentioned, which does make it more difficult for FERC to operate in this area. I do think we have some significant issues, and uh, I hope this hearing can help us resolve those. And I yield back the balance of my time. Time has expired. The chair recognizes uh, excuse me, the uh, gentlelady from Wisconsin, Ms. Baldwin, for an opening statement. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Transmission is critical to our nation's electrical system, and I certainly support grid expansion. I have significant concerns, however, about many of the recent federal proposals that jeopardize state and regional efforts to develop the transmission grid. Specifically, these efforts ignore progress and may actually slow investments being made in states like Wisconsin and others in the Midwest. Over the last seven years, my home state of Wisconsin, uh, the Wisconsin ratepayers have supported more than $2 billion in investments in our transmission system. These actions have and will continue to improve reliability and increase the flow of renewable energy in Wisconsin and our neighboring states. Congress must ensure that we are not undermining the existing processes if we are going to venture into the transmission arena, especially when sensitivities already exist to state authority, cost allocation, safety, and eminent domain issues. As we examine these issues, there are some questions and challenges that we must keep in mind. Who's going to pay for this? Will those not receiving the benefits of transmission have to pay for the cost of lines traversing this country? I'm hearing strong concerns about the d designing our transmission system for one specific purpose. It's not the job of transmission planners or transmission companies to choose the types of generation that may interconnect with the transmission system. Transmission is needed plain and simple regardless of the type of generation. And where I come from, transmission is a sensitive subject. It will be very difficult to convince Wisconsinites and other Americans that in the name of national interest, the federal government is taking their property to essentially stretch an extension cord across it to power a larger urban uh, area many, many miles away. So what will this process be like for public input if it is a federally directed process? While the siting of underground transmission lines may be easier than that of above ground lines, the costs are significantly increased, perhaps as much as $3 million uh, per mile. So mandating technologies on states and regions has significant uh, ramifications. Again, I share the goal of ensuring that critical new investments are made in our transmission system, but we must proceed with caution, not undermining existing efforts that are already working in this process. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Great. The gentlelady's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Pitts. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this hearing on our national transmission policy. The official report on the 2003 Northeastern blackout concluded that, quote, as evidenced by the absence of major transmission projects undertaken in North America over the past 10 to 15 years, utilities have found ways to increase the utilization of their existing facilities to meet increasing demands without adding significant high voltage equipment." End quote. Clearly, there is a significant need for an increase in transmission capacity. This need is amplified as we consider adding more and more renewable energy to the grid. And while I am fully supportive of adding more transmission capacity, I believe we do need to keep in mind the legitimate desires of localities to preserve green spaces and historic sites. My district includes some of the most pristine historic landscapes in the Mid-Atlantic. My district also has some of the most productive farmland in the United States. Chester County, the home of Valley Forge in the Brandywine Valley, where I come from, is one of William Penn's original three counties. The tradition of preserving land and being good stewards of the earth have been passed down from generation to generation. We're not against progress, but we want to protect our heritage and be wise about how we use and develop the land we have. Having the needed energy to turn on lights and heat water is critically important to the quality of life to every American. However, the preservation of our historic resources and natural environment of people's communities contributes to our quality of life as well. We need to ensure that all stakeholders are included in deciding where and when transmission lines are sited. Dialogue and compromise are key in this issue. Indeed, it is critical to strike a delicate balance between the crucial electricity needs of the country while at the same time maintaining the historic open space areas that make our country beautiful and unique. 
as this committee continues to consider this issue, I hope that we hear from all affected parties and work towards viable solutions. Mr. Chairman, I am grateful for the opportunity to discuss this issue, and it is my hope that today's hearing is only one in a series of hearings on this issue to ensure a robust and well-rounded approach to our national transmission policy. And I look forward to hearing from our witnesses and yield back. Great. Uh, I thank the uh, gentleman. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Welsh. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I actually want to uh, just get my microphone to work here. I uh, am proud that we have here today as one of our uh, witnesses, David Cohen. Uh, David is a member of the Public uh, Service Board in Vermont, serving on his third term. Uh, and he's been appointed by Republican and Democratic governors alike. He's done a tremendous job. Uh, he's now a vice president of the National Association of, Regula uh, Association of Regulatory uh, Utility Commissioners. Uh, David uh, is acutely uh, sensitive to the particular needs uh, of uh, rural utilities. We're a small state, uh, but this issue of transmission is incredibly important to us uh, as it is all around. So I want to welcome him and uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for inviting David to be here and, and, uh, and add to uh, the testimony. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Scalise. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, renewable energies will play an important role in the future of our national energy policy, and I support the development of renewable sources of energy. As a matter of fact, Republicans have drafted legislation, the American Energy Act, which will invest heavily in the development of renewable sources of energy. As we explore the advancement and promotion of energy sources like wind, solar, and hydro, and as the Congress and this administration discuss the future of our national grid and its capacity, we must not neglect that many of these renewable sources of energy are intermittent mm -hmm. and need to be backed up by other sources of energy. And we would be remiss if we do not emphasize the importance of diversifying our energy portfolio and ensuring that nuclear power is part of any comprehensive energy policy we discuss. Wind and solar power still need to, be, uh, still need to overcome fundamental obstacles, and we cannot today exclusively rely on these sources of energy alone to power our nation. When the wind stops blowing and the sun, sun stops shining, our hospitals that care for our families and schools that teach our children must continue to have reliable sources of energy that ensure that the life-saving equipment and the lights stay on. Transmission infrastructure, planning, and siting policies are all important to this conversation, as is the regulatory framework that will surround these policies. I believe it is also important for the Congress to carefully weigh regional considerations as we further discuss this issue. Look forward to today's, today's hearing, and I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Butterfield. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to move one seat down so I can have the benefit of this microphone. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for convening this hearing. I particularly want to thank the five witnesses who have come forward today to, to make their testimonies available. Uh, it goes without saying, Mr. Chairman, that I support the expanding of, of the grid uh, using 21st century technology. Uh, we certainly must do that. Uh, Waxman Market takes dramatic steps to further the growth of renewable electric generation. The nationwide RES standard and demands use of those sources, and the price signal sent from a carbon cap will further the use of clean fuels. As we move forward, Mr. Chairman, we must focus on developing policies that ensure electricity generated from these new sources gets to the load centers that, that demand them. And this means we must address the deficiencies in our transmission grid that will delay us from reaching our full renewable generation potential or hamper grid efficiency. There are a number of challenges to improving transmission, but siting will be particularly difficult to overcome. Uh, balancing the federal and state and regional and local uh, stakeholder needs and interests will be difficult but critical uh, to the completion of, the, of, a, of a modernized grid. Uh, comprehensive planning, cost allocation, and ownership will also present challenges, as we have heard today. Uh, I applaud the collaborative nature of this subcommittee. Look forward to discussing the issue further. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Uh, the chair recognizes the gentlelady from California, Ms. Harmon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We're uh, debating on the floor um, a, a bill to uh, have the FDA regulate tobacco, and I have to say it's a long time in coming, and I'm absolutely thrilled that we will finally, I believe, uh, pass it, and it will become law very soon. 
So while I'm celebrating about that, I'm thinking about another hard issue, uh, this one, uh, which will require all of us to step up and, and think about uh, um, some risky strategies to make certain that the promise of renewable energy and the absolute need for um, transmission of electricity uh, throughout the country uh, can be accomplished. Um, I think anything we do in this committee will uh, make us a few friends and make us a few enemies. And that applies to us regardless of which party we're in and which region we're from. Uh, but I think uh, we have to step up, as uh, many people finally have stepped up in both parties to the need to regulate uh, tobacco. Um, just want to point out some of the obstacles. Uh, uh, the U.S. electric transmission system encomp encompasses about 167,000 miles of high voltage transmission lines and another 300 thousand miles of lower voltage lines. The grid is operated by approximately 130 balancing authorities, which are typically utilities that own transition systems and operate control centers to monitor and control the grid. Uh, those transmission systems are owned by several hundred private and public entities. So let's just start with that. It's incredibly complex. And if we don't uh, get a handle on that and don't step up to the tough decisions, we won't solve the problem. But I, I would just close by saying that if, if we really want renewable energy in this country, we really have to fix the grid. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great. Okay, gentle ladies, time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I have a full statement I'd like to place into the record. Uh, and just a little history in the 05 Energy Act, we actually provided for the federal uh, transmission corridors that are so needed. And like my colleagues, uh, some of my colleagues have said, we disagree with the court decision. Hopefully it will be overturned by the um, Supreme Court, but there are things we can do that may help, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate both Mr. Inslee's legislation and um, to, to expand and have a national grid. We know that, and it can't be just limited to renewables uh, because those electricity uh, protons don't decide what they're gonna, where they come from. They just go down those lines. And uh, so that's why I'm, I'm happy to be part of the hearing. And again, I'd like my full statement to be placed in the record. And again, support our effort to expand the national grid. I have a, a huge transmission corridor right behind my neighborhood. On my, and I guess in Texas, we don't have any problem with pipelines or transmission grids because our PUC just approved $5 billion for the renewable uh, fuel uh, electricity to come from West Texas to our urban market. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back my time. Great. Gentlemen's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Pallone. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to first thank you, uh, you know, for all that you've done on um, this issue. I mean, there's, there's, uh, I know it's been so many years and we finally passed a bill at a committee and I know that we'll pass it on the floor and send it to the president eventually. Um, I wanted to point out that uh, Ralph Izzo, chairman and CEO of the Public Service Enterprise Group, a New Jersey-based energy company, will be testifying on today's second panel. And under Ralph's leadership, PSE&G has been a leader in renewable energy investments throughout the state of New Jersey. Today, the committee will address policy proposals for transmission planning, cost allocation, and siting authority. A strong transmission grid is essential to ensure energy reliability and to move clean renewable energy from remote locations to population centers. I think we can all agree that planning and investing in a reliable grid is a national priority. That said, we need to be very careful how we craft any new national transmission policy. Two main areas of concern for the Northeast and specifically for New Jersey are how to site new transmission lines and how to pay for those new lines. It's critical that states like New Jersey have authority over the siting of new transmission lines that would run through the state. Giving FERC greater authority to site high voltage electric transmission lines will generate widespread local opposition. Any new transmission legislation must give states adequate authority over siting to ensure that states can protect property, the environment, and cultural and historical sites. Another issue that will affect my state is cost allocation, specifically how do we craft legislation that encourages investment in new transmission lines to move renewable energy, such as wind, to population centers. I believe we should think regionally. New Jersey has tremendous potential to meet our renewable energy goals through solar and offshore wind. It does not make sense for New Jersey ratepayers to subsidize the cost of moving wind from the Midwest to the East Coast a cost of $10 million per mile. This could slow development of alternatives closer to home. 
I believe the transmission provisions that were passed in the American Clean Energy and Security Act provide a balanced approach that respects regional differences and local concerns. Before we pass comprehensive transmission legislation, we must consider how it will affect the economies of local renewable energy projects and whether it provides adequate siting authority for the States. But again, thank you again, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman very much. Uh, Chair recognizes the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Barrow. The gentleman waves his opening statement. All time for opening statements has been completed. We will now turn to our a very distinguished panel and our first witness, who is John uh, Wellinghoff. He is the chairman of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, which oversees wholesale electric transactions and interstate electric transmission and gas transportation in the United States. Uh, he is also co-chair of the Demand Response Collaborative launched jointly by FERC and the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners. Uh, we thank you so much for uh, being here in your first appearance before our committee. We welcome you, sir. Whenever you are ready, please begin. Good morning, and uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Could you, turn, could you just push the microphone uh, a little bit closer and you can turn it on, okay? Good, good morning. Good, thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Ranking Member Upton, members of the subcommittee. First, I have two quick preliminary issues. One is I'd like to uh, recognize and thank my colleague, Commissioner Phil Muller, who's here with me today. And I'd also like to request that my full pre file testimony be placed in the record. In this Without proceeding. objection, so ordered. The uh, following is a summary of that testimony. I appreciate the opportunity to appear <clears throat> before you today to discuss our nation's electric transmission grid. Mr. Chairman, your invitation for this hearing envisions, quote, a transmission system that will serve the goals of substantially reducing greenhouse gas emissions, developing renewable energy resources, and improving energy efficiency while preserving or enhancing reliability. A transmission system that meets the goals you have articulated will result from a strong and smart electric grid that can assist in promoting fuel diversity, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, strengthening our national security, revitalizing our economy, enhancing competition, and ensuring reliability. Such a reliable and robust transmission grid is essential to allowing regions, states, and our nation to meet these goals. The Commission has taken a number of important steps in recent years to promote the development of such a transmission system. For example, in February of 2007, the Commission issued Order 890, which, among other things, required open, transparent, and coordinated regional transmission planning and required evaluation in that planning of demand resources on a comparable basis to other resources. The Commission also approved an initiative proposal from the California Independent System Operator to better allocate costs of facilities needed to interconnect local location-constrained resources, such as wind and solar, to the transmission grid. Nonetheless, I believe there are gaps in the Commission's statutory authority. The absence of an adequate regulatory framework is the principal ob obstacle to developing a transmission system that can support the goals you have outlined. If we are to overcome that obstacle, we need a national policy commitment to develop such a transmission system. And in developing that policy, Congress should consider three closely related issues, planning, siting, and cost allocation. First, the scope of existing regional planning initiatives needs to be expanded. To achieve greater benefits and efficiencies, we must create a structure that includes coordination on an interregional basis. Such coordination will facilitate, for example, the development of facilities to transport power from areas rich in renewable energy resources to load centers, as well as the deployment of distributed resources and key smart grid equipment and systems. Second, States should continue to have the opportunity to site transmission facilities, but transmission developers should have recourse to the Commission as a federal siting authority under appropriate circumstances. Federal siting authority would be helpful even if limited only to transmission facilities needed to reliably meet renewable energy goals. Third, if Congress determines there are broad public interest benefits in developing the transmission system necessary to meet the goals discussed, then Congress should consider clarifying the Commission's authority to allocate costs of such infrastructure to the load-serving entities within an interconnection or part of an interconnection where it is appropriate to do so. 
Of course, the Commission would need to ensure, as it does today, that these costs are allocated fairly to the appropriate entities and that due deference is accorded regions that work together to develop cost allocation mechanisms that garner broad support. Finally, it's important to recognize that the issue is not how to choose between nearby renewable or more distant renewable resources. Both should be part of the mix of energy resources to achieve our national goals. And appropriately allocating the costs of transmission facilities needed to connect remote resources should not disrupt the implementation of state policies or disadvantage local renewable or other distributed resources. Rather, full planning analysis that reveals the respective costs of alternative resource scenarios and a fair cost allocation of necessary transmission to reliably deliver those resources to loads will eliminate a barrier to the development of new clean resources and thus will facilitate competition. Such a measured approach should inform consumers of the least cost sustainable resource options to meet state and national environmental, economic and security objectives. And enacting a regulatory structure that enables such an approach to be implemented will ensure our national energy goals can be achieved. Thank you again for the opportunity to appear before you. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wellinghoff, very much. Our next uh, witness is David uh, Cohen. He is the first Vice President of the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners. Uh, Mr. Cohen has also served as a member of the Vermont Public Service Board since 1995 uh, and uh, has continued. He, is, uh, he has served in a, a variety of regional and national leadership positions, including the chair of the Consumer Affairs Committee of the New England Conference of Public Utility Commissioners. Uh, we welcome you, sir. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Good morning, Chairman Markey, Ranking Member Upton, and members of the subcommittee. My name is David Cohen. I am a member of the Vermont Public Service Board. I also serve as the first Vice President of the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners, also known as NARUC. I'm honored to have this opportunity be, to appear before you this morning and offer a state perspective on transmission. In addition, I would like to thank Representative Wells for his kind introduction and his service to our state. He is certainly my favorite congressman from Vermont. <laughs> At the state level, uh, we deal with transmission planning and siting requests regularly, and I can tell you that the issues and concerns are not policy or procedural, but multifaceted and do not lend themselves to a one-size-fits-all solution. State commissioners are obligated to act deliberately to ensure that any new projects will benefit the public. This means regulators must determine whether demand response, energy efficiency, or perhaps a local renewable energy source is more appropriate than putting steel transmission towers in the ground. A major impediment to citing energy infrastructure is the great difficulty in getting public acceptance. As a country, we want our electricity to be affordable, reliable, and increasingly clean, but we also want to ensure that transmission infrastructure does not impact our quality of life. Public hearings on transmission lines are always packed with concerned ratepayers and landowners, with nearly all of them in opposition to, pro to the project. I can assure you that no level of federal involvement will make this go away. Still, the state and local level provides an important venue for all parties to be heard. State regulators know the geography and citizenry, citizenry better than any federal agency can. Our processes are transparent and give all parties a voice. What some interests may consider roadblocks or impediments, we consider due process. Let me say a few words about what we're doing in Vermont. Vermont has a transmission planning process that analyzes potential transmission constraints over a 20-year horizon and considers various alternatives, including distributed generation and targeted energy efficiency programs that would address any identified reliability issues. This process, the process ensures that solutions to transmission constraints serve the long-term needs of consumers at the lowest cost. After decades, without any major transmission investment, the Public Service Board has approved three major transmission projects from 2005 through 2008, with total projected capital investment over half a billion dollars. At the regional level, these decades without any major transmission investment, nearly $4 billion of transmission infrastructure has been placed in service in New England since 2002. 
Despite the activity on the state and regional level, there is momentum in Congress to provide the federal government with broader transmission authority, although we are just four years removed from the enactment of the Energy Policy Act of 2005. EPAC gave, gave the Federal Re Energy Regulatory Commission backstop citing authority in specific areas designated by the Department of Energy. Not enough time has passed to determine whether this law needs to be revisited. But the Congress addressing this issue nevertheless. NARU recently updated our transmission policy in anticipation of federal action. We believe that a bottom-up, state and regional driven approach is the most appropriate model going forward, while we are not convinced that the case has been made for expanded federal authority. If Congress chooses to act, we recommend the following principles. Any such additional authority granted to FERC by the legislation allow for primary siting jurisdiction by the states and provide the FERC, a FERC's backstop siting authority be as limited as possible. In no event should FERC be granted any additional authority over the siting or construction of new interstate transmission lines. In no event should FERC be granted any additional authority to approve a new interstate transmission line that is not consistent with a regional transmission plan developed in coordination with affected state commission or other siting authorities or regional planning groups. In no event should FERC be granted any additional authority to, to approve a new interstate transmission line unless there is already in place either a cost allocation agreement among all the states through which the proposed project will pass governing how the project will be financed and paid for, or a FERC approved cost allocation rule that covers the entire route to the proposed project. In no event should any legislation allow FERC to preempt state authority over retail rate making, the mitigation of local environmental impacts under state authority, the interconnection to distribution facilities, the siting of generation, or the participation by affected stakeholders in state and or regional planning processes. And in no event should any legislation pre preempt existing state authority to regulate bundled retail transmission services. In conclusion, the electric transmission system must have the capacity to meet the growing energy needs of the nation regardless of the generation source. The solutions to the challenges will not come quickly or easily and will require the cooperation of all stakeholders, including state and federal governments. Thank you, and I look forward to your question. We thank you very much. I'm now going to turn to Congresswoman Baldwin to introduce our next witness. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am pleased to welcome a very special constituent uh, to our hearing today. In 2007, uh, Governor Jim Doyle appointed Lauren Azar to the Wisconsin Public Service Commission. As a commissioner, she has played a leading role in confronting the challenges associated with transmission development. Just yesterday, the Wisconsin PSC cited a very significant transmission line. Lauren also serves as president of the organization of MISO states, where she's leading a regional planning and cost allocation uh, effort for developing electrical transmission over the Midwest ISO region, which includes 13 states and one Canadian province. Prior to her appointment to the Wisconsin PSC, uh, Commissioner Azar worked as an attorney and practiced extensively in the areas of electric and water utilities representing both ratepayers and utilities. She helped to create the nation's first standalone transmission company, American Transmission Company, otherwise known as ATC, and helped to site a 210-mile extra high voltage line in Wisconsin and Minnesota. In addition to all of these credentials, um, I can also tell you uh, tell you that I know what she eats for breakfast and what she grows in her vegetable garden because for those of you who don't know, Lauren is also my partner. Um, and it's a thrill and a very proud moment to have her here to testify based on her significant expertise on the issues before us. I welcome her to our subcommittee. Thank you, Congresswoman. And Mr. We, Chairman. We welcome and, uh, you whenever you're ready, please begin. Uh, thank you, Ranking Member uh, uh, Upton and the members of the subcommittee. Uh, thanks for inviting me to appear at this uh, hearing on the future of the grid. And my primary messages for today are number one, before a transmission grid can be cost effectively planned, Congress must define the goals for that grid. Number two, states with technical assistance from the regional and utility transmission engineers should plan the grid and site transmission lines. Three, Congress should define the framework through which the states will design and cite the grid. If the states fail, then it's appropriate for the federal government to step in. And four, Congress should agree to do no harm. 
by not selecting a specific grid design or technology and by not selecting a specific cost allocation. As to point number one, Congress should define the goals. The renewable energy standards and carbon limits that Congress may set will define the de generation portfolio that our nation will need to develop. With clear identification of RES and the carbon mandates, the states can begin designing the transmission grid that is necessary for that generation portfolio. Point number two, states should develop the plan and cite the lines. There are a variety of reasons why a state-led process will lead to better results than a federally-led process. And these reasons include, first, state commissions have the ultimate responsibility for retail electric rates. Second, planning must accommodate state choices for generation and demand-side programs, the distribution uh, decisions that they've made. Third, planning must incorporate the designs for the existing state transmission and distribution systems. And lastly, state decision making allows more complete public information, participation, and acceptance. Point number three, Congress should define the process. Congress could define the parameters for a state-led process. Such parameters could include the following. Essentially, require the states to participate in regional planning initiatives to design a grid that will meet the congressional mandates. Set strict but reasonable deadlines for the planning product and the siting of lines in that plan. Ensure the parties who will profit from this grid build-out do not make the decisions for that build-out. And lastly, if states do not complete the plan or the siting of the lines in that plan, then the federal government should intervene. Point number four, Congress should do no harm. I ask you to take a Hippocratic oath today. And uh, such an oath would require you not to do two things. Number one, do not pick technologies or plans. While the moniker, quote, transmission superhighway, end quote, sounds good, depending on the goals of Congress, it may not be what we need. I suspect a one-size-fits-all solution, such as the 765 grid overlay, will not be cost-effective, will likely be oversized, and will harm some areas. As an aside, the parties who are advocating for a 765 grid overlay are the very parties that will make a lot of money off of that plan. And the second point about not doing harm is do not s select a specific cost allocation uh, for the grid. Because cost allocation should be tailored to the plan developed, Congress should not pre-select such an option. If Congress mandates a specific cost allocation, it will be indirectly endorsing a specific type of design. For instance, endorsing a so-called postage stamp, which allocates the costs evenly over a very large area, is more appropriate for an, an alternating current solution than a direct current solution. In conclusion, I ask Congress to promptly set renewable standards and carbon limits so that the problem is defined. I also ask that Congress essentially lock the states in a room and instruct them to solve the problem within a specified time period. The $80 million already appropriated under the ARRA will provide the funding necessary to conduct this endeavor. After being locked in the proverbial room for a reasonable period of time, if the states are unable to design a transmission grid meeting the congressional mandates, then the federal government should step in. The same framework should also be applied to transmission siting. Um, I see I still have 43 seconds, so I'm going to um, just quickly um, provide a quick summary of some of the efforts that are currently happening within the states as far as regional planning and siting. Um, the chairman and Congresswoman Baldwin al already referenced one of them, which is uh, namely the organization of MISO states, and that's the Midwest Independent System Operator. The states within that 13 region, 13 state region and one Canadian province are uh, currently uh, developing a regional plan and cost allocation process, and we expect to have that done by the end of the year. Um, more, I think, uh, importantly to this co committee's work, um, in the ARRA, uh, Congress identified that they wanted to have interconnection-wide plans. And uh, on May 15th, um, leaders from the eight different regions within the Eastern Interconnection met um, to begin the process of planning 
um, on the interconnection wide basis. Uh, at the end of this month, uh, we expect to have all 40 states present at a meeting uh, in which we will begin to discuss just how uh, we expect to go forward in uh, that, uh, that process and what the state's role should be in that process. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. We thank you uh, very much for being here today and for your testimony. Our next uh, witness is Paul Hibbard. He is the chairman of the Massachusetts Department of Public Utilities. Chairman Hibbard previously worked for the Massachusetts uh, Department of Environmental uh, Protection. Uh, we welcome you, sir. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also want to thank the members of the committee for inviting me here today to uh, talk to you about this critical topic. On behalf of Governor Deval Patrick and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, I want to thank you all for your leadership in addressing our, our energy challenges and global climate change and for your wisdom in addressing both at the same time in the ACES legislation. We support your efforts and, to, and encourage Congress to move forward with the ACES legislation expeditiously. On transmission, we think a, that ACES got the transmission planning and siting question exactly right. In its current form, it presents a measured and sensible approach that supports the continued and vital primary role of state and regional resource planning and siting efforts and expands the role of FERC to coordinate resource, resource, regional planning across a broader geographical footprint and with an added focus on national energy policy. But most importantly, it does so without jeopardizing the critically important role of competition in wholesale energy markets. In contrast, I have serious concerns with the more aggressive proposals that have been put forward uh, to expand federal authority in transmission planning and siting. At their core, these proposals appear to put FERC in three roles. First, in, in the role of requiring the development in a short period of time of interconnection-wide plans like the JCSP, ostensibly to access renewable resources. Second, it puts FERC in the role of deeming transmission included in such plans as needed for the public convenience and welfare, triggering the siting override and eminent domain authorities. And third, it puts FERC in the role of approving or imposing the allocation of associated costs on a broad basis across all load. Under these proposals, FERC's, uh, under these proposals, FERC's traditional authority is expanded to where it becomes a de facto central planning authority to select and direct the build out of renewable generating resources across the nation, potentially diminishing the development of the abundant level of demand reduction and renewable resources that are available at the local level in all of our regions. Developing renewable resources locally is a top priority for the Commonwealth, as I'm sure it is for states across the country. We believe that renewable resources in our state and along the eastern seaboard, both onshore and offshore, represent one of our nation's most promising yet underdeveloped renewable uh, resources, sources of energy. While offshore wind installation costs currently exceed those of onshore installations, these resources are much closer to our load centers. Uh, in research and development efforts that are focused on reducing costs and improving reliability, promise to make offshore wind competitive with uh, distant but onshore wind farms on a delivered cost of power basis. As regional onshore projects move forward and offshore wind moves into commercialization in the United States, they all must have the opportunity to compete on an even playing field with the onshore and more remote sources of renewable power and not be disadvantaged by upfront transmission subsidies. The threat that unsubsidized local renewables would be unable to compete, in fact, has been taken very seriously in our region and beyond. A bipartisan group of 11 governors representing every coastal state from Maine to Virginia, as well as Vermont, um, recently joined together to raise these concerns in a letter to the committee chairman. A top-down central planning process is in stark contrast to how free markets are supposed to operate in our region and at, at the direction of FERC to ensure fair competition, all generating resources, renewable or otherwise, are responsible for all development costs, including the cost of environmental compliance and the cost of delivering their power reliably to load. In this competitive market context, it's the lowest cost provider based upon the price at retail that prevails, ensuring that society's electric reliability and environmental goals are met at the lowest possible cost. Um, notably, this is the design principle under ACES, where the prices offered by fossil fuel resources will be higher and less competitive due to the additional marginal costs associated with purchasing carbon allowances. And the, and the price offered by renewable resources will be lower and more competitive 
due to the additional marginal revenues associated with the generation of renewable energy credits and other incentives. In this framework, there is no need for a central planning decisions to force development or to pick the winning resources because by definition the cost of carbon allowances and the value of renewable energy credits will rise to levels that are needed to support the resources that must come online in order for our nation to meet our carbon cap and our renewable resource floor. This is the way it's supposed to work and indeed has worked in emission markets over the past couple of decades. By suggesting that FERC needs to engage in resource planning to build transmission to pre-selected renewable resources is to concede at the outset that the free market structure for emission control and renewable development contained in ACES will fail. In my view, the more aggressive proposals for transmission legislation thus are about much more than siting. They force the federal government into an administrative role of central renewable resource planning, a role that I believe in the long run will, dis will uh, damage the operation of competitive markets, suppress the technological innovation and creativity that come from the operation of competition, um, and ultimately will result in our meeting our climate objectives at prices to retail consumers of electricity that higher than the otherwise uh, are higher than they otherwise would need to be. So I want to again thank the members of the committee for this opportunity. Look forward to questions. Thank you, Mr. Hibbard. Now we have one final, very important witness representing the Western States governors, who, who I think we should all hear from before we cast our vote on the floor on the last vote of the day. Then we'll reassemble uh, uh, after that roll call. But I think since we're all here right now, uh, that we'll hear from Rich Halvey, who is the Energy Program Director for the Western. Uh, governors Association and representing those uh, Western governors uh, before this subcommittee today. We welcome you, sir. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, members of the committee, thank you for the invitation to testify here today. Could you move that microphone in a little closer? Thank you. Over the last eight years, the Western Governors Association has assumed a strong leadership role in defining policies for transmission planning, cost allocation, and regional cooperation. In 2002, a protocol governing cooperation among state and federal agencies in the siting and permitting of interstate transmission lines in the Western United States was developed and signed by the WGA, the Departments of Energy, Interior, uh, and Agriculture. And Suspend for one second, sir. Okay. Recommence. Thank you. And the Council on Environmental Quality. In June 2006, the Western Governors Association published a report that explained that while vast resources, renewable resources, exist throughout the West, many reside in remote areas without ready or cost effective access to transmission. Lack of transmission access was and remains the greatest impediment to the rapid development of utility scale renewable rich resource areas. In April 2008, the Western Governors partnered with the uh, United States Departments of Energy, Interior, Agriculture, and the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to create the Western Renewable Energy Zones project. This project will ultimately identify those areas with the highest potential for large-scale, cost-effective renewable energy development across the Western region and the high-voltage transmission that would ensure this electricity can be delivered to demand centers. This coming Monday, the Western Governors Association will be releasing the Project Phase One report quantifying the potential of the richest renewable resource areas. WGA will continue to work on the project over the next two years. We're partnering with utilities and the uh, Western Electricity Coordinating Council to evaluate transmission needs to move power from preferred renewable energy zones. We will be working to improve the integration of wildlife and environmental values in decisions on the development of generation and transmission associated with these renewable energy zones. Ultimately, we will propose conceptual transmission plans to move electricity from the most desirable zones to markets. We will work with load serving entities to coordinate purchasing from the desirable renewable energy zones and to foment interstate cooperation for renewable energy generation and transmission. The Western Governors support the development of interconnection-wide transmission plans. However, if the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission is given the authority to approve such plans, Congress needs to set explicit criteria by which FERC evaluates these plans. At a minimum, statutory criteria should require that the states approve electricity future scenarios to be studied and approve interconnection-wide plans corresponding to the future scenarios. Even with the success of our past efforts, the Western Governors recognize that we need help from the Congress. I will mention four positions the Governors have consistently emphasized as necessary elements of transmission planning, cost allocation, and regional cooperation where legislation will be critical. 
First, the Federal Government should be responsible for ensuring that near-term projects proposed to serve large, geographically constrained, low-carbon resource areas are adequately sized to meet long-term needs. When we know future demand will materialize, action by the Federal Government to correctly size lines will help projects capture economies of scale in building transmission and avoid environmental impacts from the construction of multiple lines to the same area. We propose that the Federal Government pay for the incremental cost of building higher capacity lines to these areas. Second, Congress should redirect the implementation of Sections 1221 and 368 of the Energy Policy Act of 2005 to preserve important transmission corridors and ensure the timely siting and permitting of large transmission lines to move geographically constrained, low carbon generation. Specifically, once high priority zones and associated conceptual transmission have been identified, Congress should direct federal land management agencies to use those results when evaluating and designating corridors. Third, the Western governors see little benefit in FERC preempting state transmission line permitting processes. The major the major hurdle for permitting transmission in the West has been securing permits from federal agencies. The implementation of federal law has resulted in lengthy and inflexible federal permitting processes. Enabling FERC to preempt state siting processes will not fix the underlying problem. I would like to mention the limited instances in which the governors could agree with FERC backstop siting authority. It must be demonstrated that the transmission line is needed to meet national carbon and renewable generation requirements comports with an interconnection-wide transmission plan, is right-sized to meet the long-term needs for geographically constrained low-carbon generation, is the lowest cost option to meet long-term needs, and where the State has failed to make a decision within a reasonably set statutory period. Finally, the Western Governors believe the current system for cost allocation in the West has worked well, and we believe it will continue to be adequate for the future. The exception, of course, would be the cost allocation as it applies to the kind of right-sizing we described. We are attaching two letters uh, to our testimony, and we, and we ask that they be included, uh, two letters that the Western Governors have sent to the Congress in 2009 regarding transmission issues. Thank you for the opportunity to talk with you today. Thank you, uh, Mr. Halvey, very much. Uh, I think this is about as important a hearing as we're going to have this year. Uh, we appreciate the opening statements from the witnesses. There are five minutes left on the House floor for us to cast uh, our vote. Uh, and so what uh, I will recommend is that we reconvene this hearing in 15 minutes, and then we will begin with questioning of the witnesses by the subcommittee members. The, the, uh, the subcommittee uh, stands in recess. <laughs> You can take off. All right. Oh, Hi, I'm Karen Madsen. I am. Excuse me. 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 Excuse